Tonight's speaker may look familiar to you because he has previously visited the library on several occasions. John Ruth is a naturalist and a musician. Among his many, many interests and activities, he's been presenting gardening and nature interpretation programs throughout New England at libraries, senior centers, and other venues for over 15 years. And without further ado, I'll turn this over to you, John. Thank, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I appreciate your hospitality and, and a special thanks to the Merrimack TV station for recording this event. Um, I, uh, as you can see in this cover slide, I'm a landscaper and a naturalist, but I was a, land, a naturalist way before I was a landscaper. I've just been interested in um, plants that grow in the wild for pretty much all my adult life and uh, just fascinating to watch how they grow, you know, how they change over time and uh, where they survive and, and where they thrive and that sort of thing. Uh, I know relatively little about pollinators. I'm, I'm much more of a botanist, but in creating this program, I've certainly learned a lot and I'm intrigued to learn more. So I'll share with, uh, I'll be sharing with you what I've learned. Um, a proud member of Massachusetts Pollinator Network. You can find us on um, online and also there's a Facebook page, uh, Facebook presence. And uh, it, uh, regardless of which New England state you live in, there's a lot of wonderful information that will be, I'm sure, um, uh, helpful to you, including uh, YouTube videos that have been recorded, you know, a, a collection of them, and just you know resources for for learning more. Uh, so on with the show. Uh, we acknowledge that we live on land that was managed and inhabited before European colonization. Please take a moment to find your location on the map, and honor those whose land we now occupy. So pollination is all about making it possible for every seed to be a little bit different from its parent. And without pollination happening, without the pollen from one flower being delivered to the pollen a, on a flower of a different plant, the plants would have no way of changing. And uh, there, there would no, be no variety. Uh, and uh, evolution would stop in its tracks or even just simple adaptation. So um, of course, insects don't set out to do this. It's, they're just... Uh, you know, lured to the flower either by the smell or the uh, or the taste of the, and and they they uh, sometimes uh, gather both nectar and pollen for their nutritional needs. Nectar gives them energy, pollen gives them protein, and in so doing, they inadvertently pick up pollen, and uh, the the flower over the course of evolution has figured out how to maximize the chances that that pollen will be deposited on the pistil to make. Uh, fertilization happened. Now, this is an amazing photograph. This is electron microscopy you're looking at. Uh, this is no, right? And the color is all made up. The, the, the color, it's like a tinted photograph, you know, from a century ago um, because there is no color photography. But what you're seeing is uh, what it looks like on the surface of a pistol, all these different pollen grains. And of course, they aren't all, they're from the right species, are they? Because uh, there are no rules that say <laughs> there, there are no ways to keep the uh, pollinator off that happens to be carrying pollen from other flowers of different species. So that means the pistil has to be very smart. It has to be a gatekeeper, if you will, and only allow the pollen of the correct species, its own species, to enter and burrow into that pistil. And, and uh, uh, you, perhaps you remember from your botany class that actually uh, you know, the germination of a, of a pollen grain, it, it goes down through the style and finds the ovary and fertilizes it that way. Um, pollination makes a difference. That poor strawberry in the middle didn't get pollen from any other flower. It only got its own pollen. The one on the right managed to get some windborne pollen from, <laughs> but no, no pollinator was allowed to visit it. But on the left-hand side, you can see how important it is that that, that flower be visited how important it is to the farmer and the gardener, right, to get a decent fruit set, uh, because open pollination is clearly advantageous to get a good-sized uh, fruit. So 80% of all plants need pollinators to set seed. The, the remainder are wind-pollinated. But look at that photo of the bee visiting <coughs> a wind-pollinated flower. So it's even some wind-pollinated flowers uh, have valuable pollen for pollinators. <coughs> pollen, remember, it gives, gives them protein. So who are these pollinators? Well, we see one vertebrate in this picture. We see a, a bird, hummingbird. And yes, they do pollinate, but, but, but the vast majority of pollinators are invertebrates. They're insects, um, uh, bees, flies, wasps, butterflies, moths, and beetles in roughly their order of importance as pollinators. Um, so uh, the insects are in trouble. A couple of years ago, um, a study came out and for 25 years, people in Germany had been, scientists had been trapping uh, flying insects and weighing them. 
uh, and, uh, and you know, keeping track, over a 25 year period, they realized that 75% of, of the insects had been lost. Like what happened to the insect? You know, 75% less insects were flying around. And those kinds of figures have been seen all over the world, sometimes even more dramatic. <clears throat> so what is going on here? <clears throat> Habitat loss and fragmentation is probably the number one problem. There just aren't enough places for wild animals, including invertebrates, to live. Uh, we've taken over a lot of, you know, with agriculture or residential or commercial development or what have you. Uh, pesticides are also a, a problem. Climate change, invasive species, diseases and parasites, and various kinds of pollution. So what is to be done? Well, we can address every one of these issues. The first one is to provide habitat. And <clears throat> environmentalists are asking us to uh, transform or at least uh, move in the direction of having um, uh, our, our land be uh, a welcome, you know, a welcoming haven for wildlife. So um, taking at least, say, 25% of lawn and, and transforming it in that way and, and making it, uh, you know, growing either trees, shrubs, vines, uh, uh, wildflowers, grasses uh, that will welcome pollinators. And in so doing, you'll bring yourself a lot of delight uh, and, and at the same time you're helping pollinators and simultaneously you might be um, enhancing the value of your property. There's nothing like uh, planting a tree, for example, to add thousands of dollars of value to your property if it's a well-placed uh, tree. And the same goes for tasteful landscaping in general. <clears throat> Please avoid synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. <clears throat> uh, you can see the word nicotine in the middle of neonicotinoid. They're neonics for short. These are terrible for uh, all, wi all wildlife, the, the pollinators, for the birds that eat the seeds. Um, this, this, uh, th these pesticides are far worse than DDT. They should be banned as they are in some countries. Uh, it, it makes sense instead to think of, of how we can control the pests uh, without the use of chemicals and barriers like floating row covers are one option. Uh, companion plants might uh, discourage some pests. Hand picking always, is, is always or could be a, real, a real, realistic approach. Organic pesticides uh, hopefully uh, might work as well or just tolerating a little bit of damage and, and realizing that plants can probably handle it. Uh, please don't spray for mosquitoes or anything else. Um, the, it doesn't work really. I mean, it, and uh, it's, it's, it's broad spectrum uh, poison that, that kills all the beneficial insects, the pollinators included. Um, so uh, if you want to deal with mosquitoes, trap them. You lure the females to a bucket of water that's, you know, has some leaves and, you know, stuff to make it really appealing. You know, that, that those decaying leaves are just what the mosquitoes are looking for uh, to provide nourishment for her eggs. And then when she lays the eggs in a bucket that has one of these uh, mosquito dunks, that's the brand, uh, brand name for, you know, BTI bacteria that, are, that will kill the mosquitoes, they'll kill the larvae. Well, uh, that's a, a way. And of course, you try to avoid having any standing water on your property that doesn't have uh, mosquito dunks or these uh, BTI bacteria in them. And if mosquitoes are bothering you, try just rubbing some uh, a, a mint. This mountain mint, by the way, is a powerhouse plant. I love it. Uh, pollinators are just uh, swarming over this, uh, over the flowers of, uh, they, they don't look special, but boy, po pollinators must find uh, a rich reward and uh, because they, they come from everywhere. Um, but you can actually uh, keep mosquitoes away for about a half hour or so uh, just by rubbing the uh, leaves on your skin, or you can uh, make a, re a, a sprayable mosquito repellent just by crushing several cups of the mint leaves and adding rub rubbing alcohol to that mix. So reducing air, water, light, and noise pollution. Uh, try to avoid having outdoor lights at all because they're lethal to moths in particular, but um, if you do have lights, please use yellow or orange LED, not incandescent. Controlling the spread of invasive species is very important because invasive species are not beneficial to wildlife in general, uh, and they're crowding out the, the native plants that are beneficial. Uh, reducing your carbon footprint, because after all, uh, when global, as global, global climate change intensifies, it's only going to harm uh, all of life, not just us. And uh, being an eco-activist and, you know, just share what you learn with other people and, 
in, a, in an inviting way, not a, a, not a judgmental or critical way, just like help, uh, you know, helping to spread the enthusiasm is really the best approach, you know, because uh, the more you do this, the more exciting it is, uh, uh, you know, to see what you're accomplishing and you're going to, um, you're going to be hopefully spreading the word about this. But also, it, there's certainly a, a, a role for people to let your legislators know that, that any um, measures uh, that they can take to protect pollinators are certainly worth their attention. So let's talk about those invasive plants. Japanese knotweed, it, yeah, right? You need to cut it back and cover it with a black plastic or something for years be, uh, before it finally gives up. Um, Oriental bittersweet, please at least lop the vines off so that, so that these seeds uh, are not formed by the plant because the birds will eat them and drop them wherever they choose. Uh, this, this pernicious vine can actually kill trees by strangling them. And I, uh, as a landscaper, I find this everywhere. Uh, Multiflora no rose is another one that just is popping up, that just commands too much, far too much space. A lot of these plants were brought over here on purpose, by the way. People just didn't know any better. Uh, and now we're stuck with them. Autumn olive is another example of this. It's a nitrogen fixing shrub, so it has an unfair advantage. It's a thorny shrub. Um, ja uh, Japanese honeysuckle, it, it, uh, it uh, leaves out early in the spring. That's one way it gets the, an, uh, a leg up on, other, on its competition. Um, Japanese barberry, uh, glossy buckthorn, Garlic mustard, it's blooming right now, and please uh, don't allow it to, you, right? Uh, but if you just pull it and let it uh, lie on the ground, those, the seed pods will continue to mature, and the seeds will be dropped anyway. So be, be careful what you do with the garlic mustard even af, you know, after you um, uh, pull it. Don't let it uh, do that. Black swallowwort is a trap for monarchs because the, uh, it's similar enough to the milkweed that the... Uh, Mother monarch knows that she must lay her egg on, so she might be tempted to lay her egg on this vine, on the leaves of this vine, and then it, that egg is doomed because it cannot, the, 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 uh, the caterpillar when it hatches will not be able to eat black swallowwort leaves. Uh, it's no longer legal to sell burning bush, as, as appealing as it is to some people. It's just an, another invasive. And you'll find Japanese pachysandra and uh, vinca or periwinkle growing in the woods. Now, I'm not saying that if you have it, you have to immediately rush out and, and get rid of it all, but just be aware. Uh, and so it's, it's not really listed in um, this article of 31 invasive plants that I'm, the, the, uh, the other ones that you've already seen are. But still, I, if, you're, if you have a choice, try to avoid the natives, uh, the non-native invasives rather, and select the native ground, uh, ground cover instead. And perhaps you've heard of or even seen Asian worms, jumping worms. I hope you don't have them on your property because they really do uh, uh, d pretty much destroy the soil and make it very difficult for plants to grow. So um, here's how you can tell them from earthworms. They thrash and twitch. They have shiny iridescent gray brown skin. They have a milky white ring or clitellum. They're mostly dry, they're, and they're close to the soil surface. You all, you'll often see them like, what are, what are these worms doing so close to the surface? You know, worms, earthworms stay under, underground unless they're uh, brought to the top by you know, saturation. Uh, and the invaded soil looks like coffee grounds. So here's what to do about them. You can, uh, you, you're not worried just about the worms themselves, but they're cocoons. Uh, so, uh, and if you want to bring them to the surface, you use a mustard solution, and then you can gather them that way. But, and kill them wherever you find them. But, uh, but as far as the cocoons go, thoroughly clean everything that comes in touch with soil that might be contaminated and don't relocate plants to, inf to uninfected areas and don't buy uncured mulch, compost, or other organic material. Curing means 104 degrees centigrade. So, so uh, be a wise consumer about that. Uh, now I'm, I'm going through a list of uh, unpleasant topics, but I really will get to the, <laughs> the plants themselves soon. But, uh, People often hesitate to be involved in, in any, any landscaping at all because they don't, uh, including nat establishing native plants because they're worried about ticks. Well, permethrin is your friend. It's a chemical that's harmless to people, uh, but it kills ticks on contact. And you can spray your clothes uh, a couple days before you use it. Uh, and it, it's quite effective and it lasts through six washings. Uh, does, does it, how, how is it with pets? Uh, it's, it's fine with pets, yeah because they're vertebrates just like us. Um, now, you can buy tick boxes for 50 bucks a pop, but you can make your own homemade tick, uh, 
uh, tick tubes with uh, toilet paper rolls, uh, soak them with permethrin, soak the cotton balls with permethrin, insert them in the tubes, and then scatter them on your property. What will happen is the mice who are looking for bedding will help themselves to these cotton balls, and then uh, in their nests, uh, that permethrin will kill the ticks on their bodies, and it's 95% effective, so it's really a good idea. And you need to know about poison ivy if you're a landscaper, right? Uh, the, probably the most important thing is never, ever, ever burn wood that might have poison ivy vine on it, which you see in the lower left slide, the lower left uh, image there, uh, because you could, you, could, uh, you could die from inhaling uh, uh, burning poison ivy vine. Uh, but of course, you can also get dermatitis, you know, the itching. So, uh, so you, you need to stay, be aware of uh, what it looks like and stay away from it, um, even though it is a native plant and it belongs here. And uh, finally, uh, it, you might, it might uh, be wise to be aware of what pressures there might be from hungry vegetarians in your neighborhood, whether it's deer or, uh, or, or uh, groundhogs or rabbits. And so you'll, you'll see the, uh, the um, CCE, Cornell Cooperative Extension, is a good resource for both uh, deer-resistant plants and for uh, groundhog-resistant plants. Uh, and for rabbit resistant, I found uh, Penn State was a good, uh, provided good information. So I mentioned that the bees are the best pollinators because they have hairy bodies and pollen sticks to, their, sticks to them much more readily than to some of the other pollinators. I don't know what kind of pollen that is attached to this bumblebee. It's awfully big, isn't it? Every, you know, remember that the pollen grains that you saw in the electron microscopy, tiny, you, you wouldn't be able to see them uh, even with a regular microscope. So, uh, but there you go. This bum bumblebee got some big pollen on it, on its body. But it, it's a good illustration for their effectiveness. So most of us think about honeybees when we think of bees because they certainly are common, probably the most common bee out there. Uh, and, and they certainly are important for agriculture. How, and, uh, and for that matter, uh, for, for that reason, people often feature the honeybee in their posters when they say, save the bees. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of economic incentive. You know, there is, think of them as livestock. People, they, they travel, sometimes these hives travel thousands of miles to, to uh, pollinate the crops in, in California, the almond trees, and then go down to Florida and you, you name it. Uh, but, uh, and of course, there are also hobbyists who don't uh, travel at all, and, and they just have their hives right, right there and, and are gathering honey. Uh, but, um, but consider the fact that the honeybee is a non-native bee. It came here, you know, colonists brought it here purposefully uh, four centuries ago from Britain. But before they came, the ecosystem was doing just fine, thank you very much, with a 400-some different native species of bees. And you can see the wide variety of sizes and shapes. Um, and most of them are not... Uh, uh, do, do not form colonies like uh, honeybees do, and most of them don't sting either. But, uh, but here is the thing to re be aware of with honeybees, even though they certainly are important to humans and, and none of us would want to get rid of them, but we should be aware that they do compete with native bees for nectar. They can also pollinate plants that we don't want to be encouraged, uh, non-native and invasive plants. And because they are livestock living in close quarters, uh, they often carry diseases and when they visit a flower, well, the native bees might pick up that disease from that, from that flower when they visit. For that reason, I encourage you to plant thyme, which is a non-native plant, but that's okay because it does the trick. Uh, it helps honeybees to be healthy. There's something about the, in the thyme flower that, that uh, helps them to combat uh, diseases and infections. Uh, now let's talk about the bumblebee, which is a native, I mean, there are many species of bumblebee, just to be clear. Uh, and this is a native bee. Uh, look at those pollen-packing saddlebags on the, on the hind leg, just like the honeybee, right? Honeybee also has them. Um, you can pet a bumblebee. You don't have to, but you could. <laughs> but, but, you know, so you really don't need to worry about bumblebees unless you're near their hive. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, and look at all these uh, crops that bumblebees are important pollinators of. So we, we, you should never get the impression that honeybees are the only pollinators of crops. Um, they also can pollinate some flowers that no other bee can. This bottle gentian will never open, a flower that never opens. And so a bumblebee is able to force its way in and help itself to the, uh, re the ample rewards of nectar uh, that it uh, gets. Um, but, and the same goes for tur turtle head. No other uh, 
uh, pollinator can make its way in there. And it's quite funny to watch. It looks like the flower is swallowing the bumblebee. <laughs> uh, there are some, uh, well, there's some bumblebees that are already extinct in New England. Here are three that are at risk, the yellow-banded, half-black, and golden northern. Some bumblebees actually are more common than they used to be. So it's, it's just, this, this is how things shake up, shake, shake out with, uh, uh, with human uh, impact on, uh, on the environment. Dr. Rob Jagir is the man, uh, UMass Dartmouth. He, he studies these bees and he's even got a bee ecology app so that you can contribute to his uh, his research, uh, and he helps you to identify the bees, that, the bumblebees that you're looking at. And he also has, uh, he has dis found out which plants are the most important for the at-risk bumblebees. After all, the ones that are more abundant don't need our help, do they? So it's the, it's the at-risk ones that he's trying to help. And so here's, uh, uh, if you just search for Jagir List, you can find this. Uh, Jagir List and uh, bumblebees. And uh, he, and that's, that was a pollen sources. Now, this, these are nectar sources, right? So he's got it, he's got it figured out. What, what do they need for nectar? What do they need for pollen? Um, uh, and here's a continuation of that list. Um, and interesting information there. The, you know, notice the bloom time in, in the center there. It, it shows you when the, uh, uh, those plants are in flower. And it'll give you uh, tips for whether that particular plant makes sense on you know where you are, uh, the, the part of your landscape, whether it's sunny, uh, what kind of soil, you know, do you have wet, medium, or dry, uh, that sort of thing. So that f bumblebee mama has to start the year in the spring from scratch. She has to find a nest. You know, it's, it's not like a honeybee where the, the hive survives through the winter. So she, she survives all by herself, and she has to come out and find a place to create a nest. And she, actually, she has to find bedding. She can't uh, gather bedding like a bird would. So, um, and then uh, and a protected place. But you know, until finally, when some of those eggs have hatched, and now she's got workers to help her out. But in, in early spring, she's got to find all those, uh, all that pollen and nectar to support her own uh, needs, plus the needs of those of the brood that she's raising. Uh, so bumblebees need bedding and protection from the elements. Uh, a, a bird box with an old bird nest would be would do. And an old uh, sometimes they they use uh, old uh, mice nests, uh, mouse nests that are abandoned, or a tree cavity might uh, uh, might be an option. So practice leave it be landscaping. In other words, just leaving a little bit of a clutter here and there so bumblebees can find a place to establish a nest. Now, honeybees and bumblebees are both in the apidae group of bees, and uh, there are others besides them. They're all long-tongued, usually solitary, okay? So the bumblebee and the honeybee are the exceptions to the rule uh, as being colony um, bees. Now, they're often ground dwellers, right? Which is another difference between, you know, uh, bumblebees and honeybees are not ground dwellers, and most apidae, apidae bees cannot sting. And the, then there's the andrenids, the mining bees that are harmless. They're fairly small. They're often banded, usually dark colored, solitary ground nesters again. And they resemble small honeybees or wasps, which is to their advantage because that makes them look more forbidding than they actually, or dangerous than they actually are. Um, now, oligolecti is a fancy name for pollen, pollinators specialization. This spring beauty bee visits spring beauty and only spring beauty for its nutritional needs. So that's, uh, that's just how important spring beauty is to this bee. Uh, there are other bees, uh, uh, other andrenid bees, which will also uh, visit the flower. And these beautiful photos come to you courtesy of Mary Ann Borge. I highly recommend that you check out her website, thenaturalweb.org. She is an amazing naturalist, an amazing photographer, and an amazing writer. Just she, she, she tells you a story about each plant uh, and the and the animals that it attracts, the insects, the birds, uh, and uh, she just really welcomes you into her world. Uh, so just if you search the naturalweb.org and uh, just name a plant, and good, there's a good chance that she's researched it. Uh, on with the list of bees. There are these sweat bees, Halictidae. Uh, uh, small, harmless. They're generalists. They they can eat a lot of uh, a lot of different types of pollen for their nutritional needs. Short tongues often brightly colored, um, as you can see. And they're called sweat bees because they're attracted to our perspiration, but they're harmless, right? And they are ground nesting. Isn't this amazing that a, there's something called a plasterer bee 
that the mother can actually line the cavity. This is a ground dwelling bee, right? Uh, line it with something that resembles plastic and, and serves that function. Uh, you know, it, it protects the, the egg um, that she lays on the side uh, from, from moisture and from any, you know, would be predators or that sort of thing. Uh, and then the liquid food is a combination of pollen and nectar. And then when that, that egg just hatches and feeds off the food and then the spring comes right out of that plastic bag and goes on with its life. Uh, so all these, 70% uh, of bees are ground nesting bees, okay? So we need to be aware of that in creating habitat. And you can, under, you can picture just how these drooping grasses have bare ground, bare soil beneath them that would be ideal for ground nesting bees. But you can also just have bare patches of soil. Uh, and uh, flat areas or earthen banks well, work well. Uh, south facing and sunny would be optimal. You could even have a sandbox and, and you, mix, you could mix uh, soil and sand in, in roughly equal proportions and see if that works. The megachilid bees are, have stout bodies, large mouth parts, usually dark colored, carry pollen under their abdomen. No other bee does this. And they are cavity nesters. They find a place, you know, instead of in the ground, they're finding some place to insert uh, their, their chambers, okay, to, to create their chambers, brood chambers. So uh, this blue orchard mason bee is, is much loved by orchardists because it's hundreds of times more efficient at pollinating flowers the, the tree flowers, than hum, honeybees, for example. Honeybee will just go from flower to flower to flower to flower to flower on the same tree. That doesn't do any good, right? The, the tree needs pollen from a different tree. Uh, and that's what this obliging blue orchard mason bee it goes, does. Much more of it will visit this flower and then go off to another tree and then go off to another tree. Um, and it's called a mason bee because she knows how to gather mud. Why does she gather mud? She gathers mud to seal off her brood chamber. In the, when she's found the cavity and she, you know, she deposits the, the bee bread and then she needs to seal off. And then, uh, and then she'll proceed to do the same you know, on, on, on down the line in this cavity until there's no more room. Um, unbelievable. Unbelievable, right? I mean, you know, when you when you teach things, you learn things. And, and so I, when I did the research, I had no idea there was such a thing as a leaf cutter bee that can cut these perfect circles out of leaves, and then she'll she'll roll it up, and then insert it into the cavity, and that is her brood chamber. Okay, <laughs> so here are and uh, I happen to have the tick trefoil. You see that listed, and so I I discovered that leaf had those perfectly uh, cut circles and I celebrated, right? Oh, all oh, right, I've got leaf cutter bees. So happy to see it. Uh, th these are some of the uh, leaves that can be used by leaf cutter bees for their brood chambers. Now, uh, th the cavity dwellers in general can be accommodated with native bee hotels. I highly recommend that if you are interested in doing this, you do your research because there's there's some good ways and the not so good ways to do this. You have to be aware that there that uh, contamination of, you know, the insects. Uh, uh, well, for one thing, if you have too too many cavities all located in one place, you can be you can really invite the, the predators and oh great you know supper is served and they'll just raid it. Um, so you might want to just uh, be aware of that. But uh, there's so many other details that uh, to be aware of. So crown bees and Colin Perrington are good uh, resources for that. Uh, you want a variety of whole sizes because there are a variety of bees, right? Uh, it's anywhere from two millimeters to 12 and a half. It's, it's easier to deal in millimeters uh, for this, these purposes. Um, buyer beware, okay? Especially if they have non-pollinator insects on, or, or non-bee hotel insects on the, on the cover, right? Or honeybees, which honeybees would not be using one, one of these, would they? Um, and uh, you should not have uh, bamboo as as your stalks, uh, you know, because it doesn't breathe well enough. So, uh, all kinds of things that people you know, people do uh, that they shouldn't be doing when they're mass producing these things. Now, here's a natural way to invite the cavity nesters. Just uh, at the end of the season, instead of doing a fall cleanup, well, do a uh, with you know neatly clip to a height of six to eight inches, eighteen inches. Uh, if the if there are stalks that are hollow or even some that can be hollowed because there are some bees that actually are looking for plants that they will then hollow out themselves. Uh, but uh, so you leave them at the end of the growing, growing season so that the next spring, you know, they're standing there all winter, then the next spring they will be available when the, when the mother 
is looking for a good place for, for those cavities for her brood, uh, brood chambers. Now, here are some candidates for uh, native plant stock for megakilvid bees. And notice how uh, that first dozen or so are all in the aster family. Uh, it's, and it's really good to get to know your, you know, be, a, be an amateur botanist. It's really exciting to learn about the plants and their plant families, and then you get to know them really quite well. Uh, aster family is very important. So, are, so is the mint family, okay? Um, both of those families are very important pollinator plants in general, as well as being good uh, providing the plant stocks for these megakilid bees. One thing to be aware of is that some bees travel farther than others. Their home range just... Uh, you know, for the sweat bee, it's pretty, uh, pretty small compared to the bumblebee or the mason bee. And, and the honeybee is, you know, figures in there too, right? But the sweat bee, only uh, an average of 300 feet uh, is your range. So, so that means that pollinator corridor, corridors are really important. We have to have enough pollinator habitat close enough so that these, these insects, these bees can find the next patch and, and keep on spreading. Flies, I mentioned as pollinators, are actually the next most important pollinator after bees. Isn't that interesting? Who, whoever thinks about flies in terms of pollinators? But yes, they, and some of them, as you can see, do their best to look like bees because that protects them. But you can tell they're flies. You know how? They only have one set, one pair of wings, and uh, bees have two pairs. Uh, okay, so, um, and this uh, article in Aust this scientist in Australia is saying, you know, we should attract flies for the raspberry crop, right? It, it, it'll, it'll help the farmers. Um, one uh, thing that we can appreciate about flies is their larvae are often good at eating pests, like a these aphids in this picture. Um, and, and let's talk about the wasps, which are, all, which are also pollinators, not often uh, thought about perhaps we, we tend to think of wasps as those those nasty things that we need to watch out for, but uh, uh, bald-faced hornet, paper wasp are are social wasps. Those that, yes, you certainly have to be careful about being near their nest, but otherwise they're not going to bother you at all. They're just going about their business. Uh, and uh, the yellow jacket is perhaps the one that you have to mo watch out for the most because it's hard to know whether there might be a, a nest right <coughs> on the ground that you might <laughs> walk over. How many of us have not had that experience? But the yellow jacket is also a wasp, not a bee, okay? And you can tell that, that it's a wasp because, well, look, look at that nice smooth body, right? It, it's not hairy like a bee. And also notice how the, uh, the legs dangle when they fly. Well, that's another hallmark characteristic of wasps. And then there are the solitary wasps, which are not, because they're solitary, they're not harmful at all because they have no uh, colony to protect. But they're really cool to watch. And they're just amazing. There's such an amazing diversity. Um, I've, I've seen that giant ichneumon wasp, and it's just amazing how she can insert that ovipositor thing way in t through wood, <laughs> through wood, <clears throat> and uh, uh, to find the insect that she's going to parasitize and lay her eggs there. Beetles are also among the. In fact, they were the most. They were the first pollinators when uh, flowering plants first uh, migrated onto land. And then there's the butterflies and moths. And butterflies are certainly the most charismatic of all the pollinators. People love uh, to establish butterfly gardens. Moths are far more numerous than butterflies, by the way. Uh, you can tell the difference. Uh, butterfly antennae are club-tipped, while moth antennae are feathery. And here are the butterfly families. There are five of them. Swallowtails, brushfoots. Brushfoots walk around on two pairs of legs only. They don't have three legs. They own, uh, three pairs. They only have two pairs. Whites and sulfurs, gossamer wings, and skippers, which look totally different the way their wings are arranged. But the swallowtails are, are the biggest and most impressive. Uh, and then there's the, the monarch. This is one of those uh, brushfoots, uh, the one that we know and love. Um, and isn't it amazing that the metamorphosis, that the two, two, large, two major transformations, one is caterpillar into chrysalis, and it has to shed its skin as it's creating a chrysalis. And then that chrysalis needs to shed its skin in order for the butterfly to emerge. So monarchs need milkweed. And common milkweed is the one they're most likely to find out in the wild. Uh, the caterpillar needs to find milkweed leaves to eat. There's no other uh, kind of plant that it can uh, sustain itself on. So, uh, however, uh, I don't recommend that you plant common milkweed because it's such a thug in your garden. It goes everywhere. Uh, and, and, and once it's there, it's almost impossible to get rid of. So, my sister has an extensive milkweed in Florida, right. okay? 
she had so many caterpillars that totally deforested her plants. <laughs> she found they will eat butternut squash. So she had no food for them and she put out the squash. Okay, I am just being, I, I've just learned a fascinating fact that, that uh, monarchs, uh, that monarch caterpillars will eat butternut squash and it can nourish them too. Uh, that, I've, I've never heard that. She has all the chrysalises. Uh, and, and she's, and she's, okay, she's got chrysalises going. Wow, I'm going to have to look that up. Thank you for sharing that. But anyway, uh, because uh, you might be interested in providing habitat for monarchs, I recommend swamp milkweed, uh, which tolerates wet places, butterfly weed, which tolerates dry places. Having said that, both of them will probably do fine in a normal garden with normal moisture. Okay, butter swamp milkweed and butterfly weed. They both want decent sun. Poke milkweed can handle sh shade. So those are three options for you if you uh, that are uh, advisable. You know, preferable to planting the common milkweed and then just losing control of your garden. Remember, I told you that the black swallowwort is a death trap. Monarchs cannot uh, eat these leaves. Uh, so here are some host plants that the eastern tiger swallowtail mama can lay her eggs on. Uh, the, the four different trees here. Uh, only the spicebush and sassafras are suitable for the spicebush swallowtail caterpillar. Uh, host plants of the, uh, you know, the, the family that includes dill and caraway and carrot and that sort of thing. Uh, those leaves are edible for the black swallowtail ca caterpillar. Some uh, host plants for the morning cloak, uh, three trees there. Uh, turtle head and plantain will do for the Baltimore checker spot. Spring azure caterpillars need flowering dogwood, viburnum, or blueberry leaves. Uh, and then there are the moths, and many of them, uh, you know, look at the, look at the list. Every, every one of them is a tree, right? So trees are very important as host plants, uh, again, for the polyphemus for the luna moth, for the cecropia. Aren't these amazing? And every one of them needs some kind of tree and, and often can use more than one uh, as a host plant. Uh, the, the, these uh, clear wing moths, the hummingbird, they look, they look kind of like a hummingbird, don't they, when they fly around from, from uh, and they're about the same size. Uh, viburnums, honeysuckles, blueberries, and members of the rose family are all host plants for clear wings. Uh, and to, uh, to find host plants Again, remember CCE, Cornell Cooperative Extension. Uh, it will talk about, uh, you'll, you'll see the, the height at maturity of these trees and shrubs uh, and, uh, and whether deer are a problem and that sort of thing. Uh, so here's, here are more of those plants, uh, the CCE list. Uh, and if you're looking to attract particular butterflies, then CCE will tell you what plants you should establish for them. For, for the caterpillars, just to be clear, you know, there's the, of course butterflies also need flowers for the adult butterflies. Now, Doug Tallamy is the man for the guy who, you know, you can watch YouTubes by him. You can read his book, Bringing Nature Home. He's an entomologist. He knows a lot about moths in particular and the, and the, the caterpillars of those moth species. And he is passionate about uh, urging us to grow native plants because he, what he points out, Lepidopteran, by the way, is a, either a butterfly or a moth, that it includes both butterflies and moths. They, those caterpillars need native plants. Why can't they eat the leaves of non-natives? Because they haven't had enough time. I mean, it takes evolution, right? It takes, uh, you know, over the a span of like maybe thousands of years for insects to figure that kind of thing out, how to break down these, these uh, toxic chemicals that are the defenses of, that, that leaves have from getting eaten. So uh, that's why uh, these native, um, mo the, the native caterpillars need native plants. And uh, caterpillars themselves are food for birds. They're the ideal baby food for birds. So a black cap chickadee mama will need to find six to 9,000 caterpillars to, to raise her brood. And she'll find them only if there are a lot of native trees and shrubs around where they can, uh, where they can uh, eat. And, and the oak is at the top of the list. 534 different species of caterpillars can eat oak leaves, um, followed by black cherry and willow. Now, I'd, I'd like to comment that even though oak is, uh, is, takes first place, I would urge you to consider willow as a tree one of my all-time favorite plants because you probably have plenty of oaks already in your in the woods surrounding you, right? So why not uh, provide something that that you they may not be able to find, which is willow? 
a fantastic plant, by the way, for pollinators in the early spring. And remember, they're hungry in the spring, right? They have to find, and this is exactly what uh, willow, pussy willow does, is that it gives them um, uh, foraging opportunities. And then we go on with the list, birch, poplar, crabapple, blueberry, maple, and elm, uh, and pine even. Can you imagine caterpillars chowing down on pine needles? Difficult to, to picture, but they do. Um, and this uh, diagram provided by Heather Holm, I highly recommend her website, pollinatorsnativeplants.com. Create soft landings, she is saying, under the oaks and other trees for overwintering caterpillars. Picture that you're a caterpillar, you've done feasting, you drop down from the tree, and if it's just lawn there, you're out of luck, right? Your, e your easy pickings are that you won't be able to burrow in for the winter. Some of these caterpillars actually burrow, f physically burrow into the soil, but um, these, these uh, options just won't be there otherwise. So uh, under, the, under these trees, just don't rake your leaves. Or you can establish ground covers underneath, you know, as a, to create that soft landing that Heather's talking about. And, and, and you can see in the lower right, the don't use landscaping fabric. There's, there's no way that that's going to be a soft landing, right? And, and try to avoid mowing in these areas because, uh, well, th there goes the, the caterpillar, right? Um, so it's not just trees and shrubs that have leaves that caterpillars can eat. There's also these goldenrod takes first place for the best uh, herbaceous plant. You know, the most caterpillars can eat goldenrod leaves, followed by asters, uh, these native sunflowers. OK, these are perennials, by the way, perennial native sunflowers. Um, the rodbeckias, like the brown-eyed Susan, black-eyed Susan, cut-leaf coneflower, uh, boneset and joe pieweed, uh, sedges. Violets, the common violets in your lawn. Wild geranium, wild strawberry can also be found in your lawn. Uh, now, uh, you might have heard about no mow may. And while uh, it might work for some people in some places, in general, I think it's misguided because uh, what happens uh, is that, um, well, for one thing, uh, dandelions might go to seed and you're kind of, you're not really doing a very good job at making pollinator habitat attractive to your, uh, to your neighbors. But uh, more, more to the point, you've got a really woolly lawn to deal with at the end of May that uh, and it's, gonna be, it's gonna be hard for the pollinators to even find the flowers uh, when the grass is that tall. Uh, and so I, I uh, recommend instead, uh, you could say light mow spring or light mow uh, for the entire season, right? Uh, every other week because Susanna Lerman has done the research to prove that lawns that are mowed every other week and that have these wildflower, you know, these, these uh, lawn flowers in them, okay, they attract 111 different species of, of uh, native bee that she discovered in, in, in uh, plots in Springfield, Massachusetts. So, so here are some of them pictured. They're not all um, native. Uh, white clover is not native to, our, uh, to New England, uh, but the self heel in, in the top center is. So are the blue, uh, common blue violets, so is the wild strawberry. Uh, and you can actually, strategically plant in some of these plants to encourage them, if you like. How about that dandelion? A lot of people are championing the dandelion. It's the first flower of spring, important. Well, actually, no, it's non-native. It's junk food. It only gives them four out of the 14 amino acids that they need, this pollen that's supposedly so great. Uh, and the, the pollen is allelopathic, which means when it lands on the pistil of another plant, of another flower, it uh, reduces that that plant's seed set. Okay, <laughs> how does it manage to, you know, pollen, right? Uh, I mean, wow, how can pollen do that? But it does. It's got some chemical that uh, just uh, makes, makes it less advantageous for the, for the flowers that's received it. Now, these are non-native. They're not uh, uh, invasive, but neither is there any pollinator value to daffodils, forsythia, and tulips. Uh, they're just eye candy, basically. Uh, some uh, plants are, are non-native, but do have pollinator value, including these snowdrops, crocus, Siberian squill, grape hyacinth. And then here are authentic native plants. Um, just, uh, you know, you can glance over these and just enjoy how beautiful they are. You know, so if, if you're wanting ornamental value, there's, there's nothing like, in my opinion, there's nothing like our own native plants. And you have a special feeling about them too, knowing that they're native, knowing that they belong here. You, they really become your friends. Uh, here's eight more. So um, 
lot of possibilities there, right, for native early spring flowers. So when you're choosing your plants, uh, nativeplanttrust.org will show you a map. Uh, and you can look at this map right now and decide, are, are you in Northeastern Highlands or Northeastern Coastal Zone? Well, uh, if you're in New England, it might be one of the, or you could be in Acadian Plains and Hills if you're in Maine. Uh, but uh, once you've decided that, you enter that information uh, in a, uh, a list of choices, okay, right there online, and you can choose the plant type, you can choose the flower color, the height, the spread at maturity, whether it's a cultivar or wild type. Hope, hopefully you'll be focusing on the wild types. Uh, whether you're looking for a sunny or shady spot, uh, the soil moisture is also a, a detail to be aware of. Uh, you know, and, and what you're trying to attract, uh, whether you want it to be tolerant of salt and deer and rabbits, etc. Any additional attributes, what you're using it for, and what, all these different conditions. And then you hit, okay, enter. What, what do you got? And the Native Plant Trust will tell you uh, what some possibilities are, given what you've asked for. So what a wonderful resource this is, nativeplanttrust.org, the Garden Plant Finder. Now let's start out with trees. And what I want to say is that you've already learned about how valuable host trees are as host plants, right? For these, for the larvae, for the caterpillars. But also just think about the flowering trees and how trees and shrubs have so many more flowers than one little wildflower. So uh, it's, when you're thinking about habitat, think about two things, biomass, just sheer size of the plant and, and number of plants, that's, that's the biomass and diversity, because that's important too. Not all pollinators, of course, can use the same plants. So they need that diversity. And, and not, they're not all blooming at the same time either. So the diversity is important. So again, here's that pussy willow that I've been championing. And uh, uh, insects really, uh, a, a wide variety of insects are swarming over those uh, pussy willows in the spring. What a beautiful tree this is. And, and look at that leaf cutter. Uh, uh, evidence right there in that photo. One of my favorite tr uh, trees, the small tree, the Juneberry. Those fruits are delicious, by the way, but birds are aware of that as well. And so <laughs> birds are uh, more able to help themselves than I am. But uh, gorgeous tree, uh, fall, fall foliage, beautiful. Uh, red maple is a uh, pollinator plant. So our oak and hickory, uh, the fruit trees. Right? Crab apple. American plum is a native tree. Hawthorn. Black cherry. It's almost a weedy tree. You'll see it pop up everywhere uh, as a gardener. Um, sweet bay magnolia. What a beautiful tree this is. Wonderfully fragrant uh, blossoms. These are all native trees, by the way. Black gum. Isn't that impressive? That fall foliage of that tree. American out mountain ash. Stunning. Sassafras, basswood, uh, and the dogwoods are pollinator plants. P pagoda dogwood, American holly, winterberry holly, tulip tree. And how about shrubs, canes, and vines for pollinators? We've got the beech plum. I've seen pollinators swarming over the, this uh, beech plum. That, and you don't need to uh, live on the Cape to grow beech plums, that even though they d do grow well on the Cape, and that's where they're most successful. If you give them a place, they will be happy and they'll use it. So where you find a plant in nature doesn't necessarily say where it can grow. If, if you find a plant in the shade in nature, but give it a spot in the sun and uh, keep the competition away, it says, thank you very much. And it just, <laughs> right, uh, I finally have a chance. Uh, so beech plum is a great selection. I love black chokeberry. These fruits are a super fruit. If you've never heard of this, do yourself a favor and do the research and learn just uh, all the different, you know, there's even a book, A is for Aronia, <laughs> written by someone who can tell you all about the uses of, uh, and I, I won't, I can't even go into, you know, you, this is about pollinators, so I wish I could sing the praises of Aronia, but uh, I love, uh, uh, I don't even like calling it black chokeberry, but because uh, <laughs> it, it's confusing because it's not choke cherry. It sounds like choke cherry, doesn't it? But it's not. And, and even though it's not at particularly edible, just popping one in your mouth, what you do is you put them in a bag, a plastic bag, in the freezer overnight. And then next morning, there I am making my black chokeberry pancakes. And it's absolutely delicious. 
But th once again, this is a pollinator plant as well as a plant for the birds, right? Inkberry, a pollinator plant. Purple flowering raspberry, isn't that gorgeous? Often found in the margins of woods. The uh, wild roses, Virginia rose and Carolina rose. And of course, the cultivated roses are worthless as far as pollinators are concerned. They're just petals. There's no pollen or nectar there, right? Uh, this is what a rose should look like if you're a pollinator. <laughs> Uh, black raspberry hardly has any flowers at all, but it's attractive to those pollinators. Blackberry, elderberry, another uh, shrub that I just, uh, I, I help, I make elderberry pancakes too, by the way. Elderberry, elderberry syrup, you do not, uh, do not uh, be without elderberry syrup because it wards off the flu. I have a question yeah. about all these berries, bushes. Will that attract bears to you? Yet? Will they attract bears? No. Oh. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, see, let's, let's, let's put this in context. The question was, will elderberries attract bears? There are elderberries. This is a native shrub, and they're all over the place. Uh, so there'd be no reason. It, it's not going to be a magnet for them like, um, well, I don't know, like leaving greasy food out or something like that. Yeah. They'd rather go after the raspberries. Okay. The raspberries. There you go. Because they can track the fishing game, track them. Okay. Okay, so there, Same there you have the it. Fishing. They'd rather go after the raspberries. Yes, we like okay. To protect our bears. Uh, okay, right. I understand. Okay, and then there's the the fl the flowering. Uh, yeah, then there's the flowering high bush blueberry and low bush blueberry, common nine bark. This is a fantastic power powerhouse plant. The, those flowers are irresistible to pollinators. Uh, uh, gorgeous common nine bark shrub. Um, but please avoid the, resist the temptation to get the purple flowered varieties of anything uh, because it's not a host plant if it's, if it's purple. You know, those insects can't eat those purple leaves. Um, and then there are viburnums, which there's such a delightful assortment of viburnums, different sizes. Uh, the birds love the fruit and, uh, and the pollinators love the flowers, right? All of these viburnums, black haw, highbush cranberry, different heights, right? Different, cat, different situations, smooth witherod. Red osier dogwood, uh, beautiful in all seasons. Uh, all the dogwoods that have fruits that birds eat, but they're also pollinator plants. Round leaf dogwood, spice bush, sweet pepper bush, definitely a good selection for attracting pollinators, including butterflies. New Jersey tea is a much smaller shrub, harder to get established, but once it's there, it's, it'll, it'll keep coming for you. Uh, Meadowsweet, doesn't even look like a shrub. It looks more like a wildflower, but it's a woody plant. Uh, same is, is, is true for steeple bush. They're closely related. Gorgeous plants, very popular with pollinators. Staggorn sumac is, is, is kind of uh, aggressive, shall we say. Uh, and uh, so, but if you don't mind, if you, if it's, it, you know, if you don't need it for anything else, that, that area where stag, uh, staggorn sumac is growing, it's got uh, wildlife benefit. It is an authentic native plant. Uh, common witch hazel is another. There is a wild hydrangea. Sweet fern is not a fern at all, it's a shrub. And there, there are native honeysuckles, the dwarf bush and the American fly honeysuckle. Mountain laurel, gorgeous. It grows in the shade, butterflies love it. Uh, and then there's a diminutive sheep laurel related to that mountain laurel. Gorgeous plant. And then all of the uh, az azaleas and rhododendrons share the same genus, the rhododendron genus. and uh, so it's easy to find all the cultivars that are tempting, right, and uh, in nurseries, but these are the authentic native species. Rose Bay rhododendron is native. And then buttonbush can grow in very wet places uh, and does grow in very wet places, but uh, uh, can handle fairly normal soil as well. And pollinators love it. American hazelnut. So uh, once you've selected a tree or, or shrub and put it in the ground, uh, think about uh, abundant com uh, mulching to keep down the competition from grass. And then don't forget to leave the leaves when they fall. In this, in the, and you might be aware that um, some hungry varmints like, uh, I don't know, rabbits or you know, in the middle of winter when it's hard for them to find anything, they might girdle your tree by chomping away on the bark. So you might want to protect those saplings. Gorgeous uh, vine here, wild clematis, even in the winter as, as uh, ornamental interest. Uh, trumpet honeysuckle is not native to New England, but it is an American uh, wildflower, and uh, honey, um, hummingbirds love it. 
Uh, I recommend Kathy Neal's flowering calendar. She's with unh.edu, extension.unh.edu. Uh, she has this calendar which shows you, uh, these are some of her favorite pollinator plants. And the idea is to have at least three plants blooming at any given time. Okay, that's for starters. And maybe at least three of each plant. So if you had spring, summer, and late summer, for example, then you would need to start out with 27 plants do, doing the math, right? Uh, three plant, uh, uh, nine different species, three of each. Anyway, th that's a rule of thumb. But you can see uh, that would be a bare bones, you know, as far as a pollinator garden. Uh, ideally, you're, you're really, ideally, you're getting excited about this and wanting to be a collector. And you know, I want that too. I want that too. <laughs> you keep on collecting. Uh, and then as these plants uh, become more abundant on your landscape, you can be generous with them and pass them out to, you know, You've got extras now, and you can give them to your friends and family and neighbors and spread the joy. Um, so uh, now Heather Holm, uh, uh, this uh, I didn't intend for this uh, for that sandy soil to be peeking out behind, but this is a uh, a poster that she's created. Provide nectar and host plants, and there she has uh, twelve. Uh, plants that are specifically attractive to butterflies, moths, and skippers. Uh, so you can visit her website, pollinatorsnativeplants.com, which I think I've already mentioned, to see this poster. She has a lot of posters like this that uh, that can help you out. Her many of them, unfortunately, are um, are focused on the Great Plains area, which which is where she is. So you have to be aware of uh, whether the but but these plants are pretty much all uh, ones that you can. Uh, are good, except for the coneflower. Purple coneflower is a, a plain species, but the rest of them are all New England as well. Uh, so now Pollinator Partnership um, has, has a, a good resource. Uh, if you go to um, pollinator.org and s select resources and planting guides, uh, it'll give you some information for the area that, that you live in. Uh, in. The green shows Eastern Broadleaf Forest, but there are other provinces as well that you can, uh, you, all you have to do is enter your zip, zip code. It will tell you which province you're in. Uh, by the way, Pollinator Week is coming up and maybe this, this will be a good motivation for you to spread the word, June 19 to 25. And it's always in June. Uh, so I'd like to show, share with you, remember the uh, uh, bees are the most important pollinators uh, and uh, uh, because of their hairy bodies. So uh, if, you were, if you're focusing on what are the best plants for native bees, well, wild bergamot takes first prize because it attracts 15 different genera of native bees. And each, each genus has several species, most likely. So that's a lot of different kinds of native bees that wild bergamot will support, in addition to the butterfly, of course, that you see nectaring on it. Uh, so gorgeous plant, kind of reminds you of bee balm, doesn't it? Um, and taking second place, Black-Eyed Susan, which is a, uh, it's a short-lived perennial. It's, it, you need to let it reseed in order to have, you know, because it, it won't just keep on coming back the same plant again and again. But it can function as a perennial if it reseeds freely. Uh, bone set at third place. And then tied for fourth place, we've got two of those milkweeds that I already told you about, the swamp and butterfly weed. Uh, and then tick seed or coreopsis. Oxeye sunflower, the mountain mint, which I've mentioned, and blue vervain, attracting 11 different genera. We've got foxglove, beard tug, cup plant, a very tall, majestic plant. New England aster, gorgeous in the fall. Golden alexanders is blooming right now in the spring. Uh, native bee magnets, again, uh, 10 different genera. Big leaf aster, wild geranium, yellow coneflower, attracting nine genera. We've got anis hyssop, purple coneflower, Jacob's ladder, Ohio spiderwort, ironweed and culver's root, a wide a range of heights in these different plants and blooming times as well. Uh, and then to round out that list, we've got harebell and wild lupin and bloodroot attracting at least seven native bee genera. So uh, once you've got your butterfly garden going, why not proudly proclaim it and get uh, uh, a sign uh, announcing to everyone that you've got a monarch way station or a certified butterfly garden, NABA, is the, uh, is the National Butterfly, American Butterfly Association, I believe is what it is, NABA dot, oh, yeah, North, excuse me, North American Butterfly Association, NABA.org. A lot of good information there. Uh, butterfly bush is the go-to plant for many people, but the problem is it's non-native, uh, which means that 
it, the leaves don't feed any caterpillars. And how are you going to have butterflies if the, if the, if the caterpillars can't find food? Uh, and also, it's prob potentially problematic because it might either be invasive now or it might become invasive as the climate warms up because it's already invasive in states to the south of us. Uh, so uh, now here's that uh, list that I uh, shared with you uh, a few slides back. Heather Holm, pollinatorsnativeplants.com. These are her favorite 12 uh, flowers for butterflies and moss. So purple coneflower is one. Uh, but try to resist the allure of cultivars because they often have inferior or non-existent <laughs> pollen, uh, pollen and nectar, or uh, pollinators might not even recognize them as being flowers, for that matter, like the green jewel. Um, and they can also be quite uh, uh, vulnerable to pests and diseases because they're inbred, and so they may not be that successful on your landscape anyway. So try to uh, uh, resist that temptation and just get what's called the straight species instead of the native Rs, you know, the cult, uh, uh, native cultivar. Uh, and uh, whenever you see that, um, the single apostrophe on either side, that means that it's a cultivar. Um, compass plant, great for butterflies, asters, New York ironweed, Joe pieweed, boneset. See, you've already seen some of these with uh, as host plants and bee plants, right? Goldenrods. One thing I'll say about goldenrods is that uh, Canada goldenrod, while it is native, it's so aggressive, it won't any, let anything else grow. I do not suggest you plant Canada goldenrod. Just be, be aware of, of uh, which, you know, there are other goldenrods that are much more well-behaved. It's a very important plant, uh, don't get me wrong, it boasts, both as a host plant and for pollinators in the fall. Uh, but just uh, use your discretion. Don't, don't invite the Canada goldenrod into your garden. Blazing star, a beautiful uh, member of the Astor family. The milkweeds, again, for, po for pollinating butterflies, right? Not just for the monarch caterpillars, but for butterflies and, and pollinators in general. Wild bergamot, again, is a butterfly plant. Cardinal flower, not only the hummingbirds, right? But uh, also butterflies go for it. Trix cap lily, what a gorgeous flower that is. No butterfly has ever, ever been found in a butterfly box. So why do they sell it? Don't ask me. Uh, well, like, unfortunately, I think I do know the answer why they sell it. But, anyway, but in instead, you're helping butterflies if you give them mud. Uh, because the males will sip the mud and the, the water, they, they filter the minerals out of the, of the mud and the water goes out the other end. Uh, and then when they mate with the females, they contribute these minerals to the uh, uh, vit uh, vitality of the eggs. Uh, so... You can either have a muddy place on your property, or you can create, you can repurpose a bird bath and add, uh, you know, use a, maybe a little gravel or sand, uh, add salt or compost to that, and keep it moist. They also like fruit, and they don't care if it's rotting. You know, it's a little-known fact that butterflies actually eat some pretty disgusting things, which I won't even name. But <laughs> uh, not that you need to offer them to them. But but anyway, rotting fruit is perfectly okay with them. Uh, now, remember, I've, I mentioned uh, uh, with ground covers, there's some, that, and, and early, early spring flowers, there are some ornamentals that don't have pollinator value at all. Uh, and here they are. So uh, I'm not a purist. And if you think these flowers are beautiful, and if you want to have a few on your uh, property, or if you can't manage to eradicate all the forsythia that you've got, well, you know, you're not doing any harm. But try to be aware that you're not doing much good either. So you, for the remainder of your landscape, if you just keep in mind the total biomass of native plants and the diversity of that biome, if you got those two bases covered, then you're doing your job. And grasses, oh my goodness. Who would have thought that pollinators appreciate them? But they do, they, they can be larval host plants. They can provide habitat for ground nesting bees as well as food for birds and overwintering habitat for eggs, caterpillar, and pupae. And here are some of those gorgeous uh, native. Uh, so when you have a wildflower garden, include the grasses. And when, when you have um, a wildflower meadow, grass seed is always included. It's not just flowers that you're es establishing. Big blue stem, broom sedge, Indian grass. Some of these have four season, season interest too. Prairie drop seeds, switch grass, purple love grass. And then there's sedges as well, which are ornamental, early season greening and blooming. 
they can do well in a rain garden. They often are quite tolerant of moist soils and they can be a ground cover. Uh, Pennsylvania sedge uh, can serve as a lawn. It can be a pretty involved trans transitioning to a lawn of Pennsylvania sedge, but it can be done. Um, so there are these two nurseries in Massachusetts uh, that Native Plant Trust um, operates where you can get uh, um, some of these native plants. And uh, so Native Plant Trust is a resource online, as I mentioned earlier, and they partner with something called Go Botany. Uh, so you can, uh, all these photos, for example, you can see uh, at Go Botany of Golden Alexanders. I'm just taking that for, uh, for example, you know, Golden Alexanders is one of those pollinator plants that you might want to learn about. So you, it, you, can, it, you can see all these photos and, and learn a lot of information about it at Go Botany. Uh, for example, the, the habitat, the wetland status, distinguishing characteristics, uh, and the distribution in New England where it can be found. You can learn about that same plant if you go to illinoiswildflowers.info and it will give you what they say, uh, what they call the, the faunal uh, associations, you know, flora and fauna. So the faunal is the animals that will visit, you know, whether they're vertebrate or invertebrate that use this plant. Uh, so you, you will learn that there is an oligolectic uh, golden Alexander's mining bee, but there is also a wide range of other pollinators that will visit this plant. And all this information is available at illinoiswildflowers.info. Uh, Missouri Botanical Garden is another resource for you. Just type in Missouri and the name of the plant, either the common or Latin name, and you'll get this information about how big that plant will get, uh, how tall, how deer wide. Like them too? Excuse me. Do you like those too? Uh, you will. Uh, it will also show uh, that information whether uh, whether a plant is deer resistant. Okay, um, and uh, so. Now, sheet mulching is a way to go to transition from lawn to uh, habitat, right? Uh, wildflowers or, uh, or shrubs or, or trees, you name it, or a combination of, of, of all the above. Um, so the first step is to figure out how you're going to smother the lawn or, or the existing vegetation that you want to kill. Um, and you can do that by overlapping pieces of cardboard. You can also buy, it's called builder's paper. That, uh, image in the lower left. You can roll it out and uh, that serves the same purpose. And if you were starting a vegetable garden, well, you'd probably put compost uh, on the, the, as the next layer. But for native plants, you might not need any compost. The soil might be plenty fertile enough. After all, you're not going for a harvest of anything. You're just wanting to give them a place where they can grow. And out, uh, out in the wilderness, no one is composting an area for them to grow. So uh, they might do just fine. Uh, but the mulch is important as the top layer. And don't get me wrong, if you want to put some compost down there, the, the plants might well appreciate it, uh, might, it might give them a boost. Um, it, it might be wise to do a soil test um, and you know, send it to, uh, well, University of Massachusetts and Amherst has uh, a soil testing lab and, and other, there are other places too. Um, and they'll and ask them to do an organic analysis as well as the pH and the minerals and you know are there any, any and and then tell them the purpose of the you know why what what are you doing you know what are your plans for that area uh, and then you you, you explain um, I'm growing wildflowers or what have you or, or shrubs and then they'll let you know if if you indeed do need to add anything to amend your uh, soil uh, so you can do sheet mulching any month of the year if there's no snow on the ground. You know, even in the middle of winter, you can get out there and put down cardboard and put down mulch on top of that. And then uh, when spring rolls around, well, uh, the, whatever would, would then be trying to grow won't have a chance to grow. And you leave it there for uh, at least a good year. And then maybe uh, you could plant in the fall. Fall is a wonderful planting time for that matter um, because the, the soil stays moist. You don't, don't need to worry about watering so much. So um, consider uh, having a... Uh, just a delightful display of wildflowers right along the roadside and, uh, you know, planting a, a sign right there saying what, explaining what you're doing. Uh, it's, it's possible to do. Hell strips, they're called, because it might be a challenge uh, with all the salt being thrown up there by, uh, by the trucks, but there's some, there's some plants that can handle that. Uh, I mentioned wildflower meadows. 
you need a fairly large area and a sunny area to consider a wildfire meadow. And it's a bit of an operation. You know, you, you need to kill the existing vegetation. You need to sow, get enough seed and sow it in the fall. Uh, but it's, it sure costs less in the long run than having to go out there and mow uh, um, umpteen times every year, right? Uh, and once again, that unh.edu site, extension.unh.edu, excellent um, tutorial on how to do a wildfire meadow if you are interested in that. Uh, but uh, only get seed from a reputable, reputable com a company. You know, sometimes you can buy a packet of wildfire seeds and people think, oh, great. Well, it might, there might be a lot of annuals. They might not be native at all. And also, if you just spread seed on bare soil, guess what comes up? Those seeds might come up, but so will a lot of weeds. So really, you have to exhaust the seed bank before you put down your seed. Uh, you know, make sure that you're, you're not going to have the weeds competing. This is one way to do it, just spreading out black plastic. Uh, you could also uh, just um, you know, get a sod cutter, for example, but that's pretty intimidating to, you know, like, what are you going to do with all that sod, right? Yes. My husband. <laughs> okay. That, uh, <laughs> so now, now you can grow wildflowers from seed. Uh, and when you do, oh my gosh, you've got a lot of plants, right? And uh, so that, that's wonderful, you know, that you can, uh, you'll have plenty to spare, plenty to give away, to be generous with, right? Wild Seed Project, that's there from Maine. It's an excellent resource both to get your seeds, you can order seeds from them, and you can also learn all about growing plants from seeds. Many seeds require a period of cold to convince them that winter is over so it's safe to germinate. Okay, they're very clever that way. So they, they can be released from dormancy by experiencing uh, winter, which is above, right, just above freezing, which is exactly what you have in your refrigerator. So you can keep the seeds moist in a plastic bag, you know, with with something to keep them moist in, like vermiculite or sand or moist paper towel. Or, of course, you could put them out in trays and leave them in uh, outside uh, and put a screen over them to pr protect them and, and just, you know, under a picnic bench or something. And they will experience winter there and then uh, keep an eye on them in spring and, and uh, watch, what, what, watch what happens. Uh, so here, here are three, uh, in addition to Wild Seed Project, the Bill Kalina and the Prairie Moon Cultural Guide are good for growing seeds. Uh, and then eventually you're going to have to put them in their own little containers and plugs are a good approach. And you can plant plugs in the fall, even though they look tiny and vulnerable. Uh, it's surprising how well they'll stand up and they'll come roaring back in the spring. And each of these is a d genetically distinct individual. They're not clones of each other. There's a time and a place to clone, right? Uh, you, you might have a, a big clump of plants and you, you want more of them. So you can, sometimes you can just pull them apart and the, the, pull the roots apart or you use the clippers. This is, this, this is some swamp milkweed that I created several independent plants from just one clump. You can also do cuttings miraculously. You know, just a stem will sometimes root for you. You might need to use a plant hormone to encourage them to do that. Uh, and you can propagate plants by layering. And uh, that way just, you know, the, the plant that is buried uh, puts down roots and then you can clip it off and, and you've got a new plant. So here are some New England native plant seed companies. I already mentioned um, Wild Seed Project uh, and uh, all of them provide those seeds uh, if you'd like to start plants from seeds. I highly recommend Native Plants of New England, a Facebook group. People post all the time about all kinds of things. They, if they're curious about what a plant is, they'll put it up and then you'll, they'll get dozens of responses. Uh, if, uh, if you have a problem area or if you just want some advice from people, I, this is what I'm looking for. You know, what can I grow here? You'll get dozens of responses and uh, people will just, people are happy to help. Um, befriend gardeners because then you can share the wealth, right? And share your knowledge too. Uh, and in fact, consider doing, uh, having parties where you, uh, you know, do a project together. Feed, feed your helpers well and they'll, and they'll come, right? Uh, and another great way to share your knowledge as well as uh, just getting to know each other. And, and please, uh, if you have any grandchildren or nieces or nephews or any other children you know, give them a chance to connect with nature and uh, it'll, it'll last them. They'll, the whole, some of our most cherished memories are uh, and, and earliest memories are of some connection to nature, picking raspberries or planting things in the garden or that kind of thing. 
all decisions must maximize the welfare of the unborn unto the seventh generation. So everything we do, we should be thinking about not just our children or grandchildren's generation, but their grandchildren and their grandchildren. Uh, that's the great binding law of the Iroquois Confederation. There's no limit to what we can do together. Start where you are, and thank you for doing your part. So thank you for coming today, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Yes. I was thinking of putting clover down in the grass. You're thinking about clover in the grass, yeah. Right, and then it, I got the impression that it wasn't native. It's not native, but it certainly is popular with the bees, and uh, and not just the honeybees. Okay. So uh, I, I wouldn't oppose that. It, cl clover has the advantage that it uh, fertilizes the soil. It's a nitrogen fixing. You know, all the, yeah. it's a member of the pea family, the bean family. So a lot of those plants will grab nitrogen from the air, yeah. And then the, the whole, the soil is fertilized, not just for themselves, but any yeah. other plants growing near it. So, uh, and it used to be that you would buy, when you bought grass seed, there would be clover seed in there. You know, it was assumed that you would want clover. Well, there is some clover in there, and, there, and I do have some other mm -hmm. pretty other flowers that come up in the grass. Mm -hmm. And they, and they Great. it's mold tall so that it right. is that, but then mm -hmm. I have bare patches. And right, that's sure. That's what I was thinking of filming yeah. it. Yeah, you could you could do that, but yeah. you could also consider plants like self heal or heal all is the okay. same same plant self heal or heal all. Yeah. Uh, wild strawberries is another choice. Blue violets is a native plant, or, okay. uh, or the other violets. Wild strawberry is another. It's a native plant and and has high value as a host plant as well. Okay. So those are some alternatives. Alternative. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have one other question too. I have yeah. a burning bush and I know it's not native. That's right. So I'm, I've been debating. It's invasive for that matter. <laughs> I've been debating on pulling it out, and the landscaper talked me out of it last year, but I still have that feeling that I should pull it out. I think you should, okay. because it is invasive. I mean, well, and you'll find little babies yeah. all over the place. That's what invasive I've never means. Found I have. And it's been, yeah. But then I understand that the birds bring it other places. That's right. They certainly do. Okay. They certainly do. Yeah. yeah so your your respect to the rest of your neighbors is, is to not not allow burning bush to okay. go to seed. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I don't have one. I get those trees. It was awful. Yeah. They were beautiful, but we had. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, that was the appeal. But neighbor doesn't have that problem. Well, you know that some some of these. When plants are spread around, you know, because of their ornamental appeal and no yeah. consideration is given to how it impacts the environment, we're just not being good stewards and we need to be. And it's not just for the pollinator survival, it's for our own survival. We, we need a, a healthy, you know, pollinator population, insect population, uh, because they are the, the cornerstone of our e uh, ecosystem. Without insects, there's nothing. <laughs> well, how do you dispose of something like a burning bush. Like How do you dispose of a burning bush? Yeah. Well, if it's not in seed, you can just put it, you know, toss it on the uh, on your on your brush pile. Okay. Yeah. The other one you mentioned is not being was the forsythia, which I was surprised at because I have Yeah. My forsythia eye. is not invasive. I, I it's not I, no, no. I just need to clarify. It's just not valuable. It doesn't do anything oh, for anybody. It just looks yeah, it just yeah. To me, it does, it to, to be honest, to me, it doesn't even look pretty. To me, it looks like an eyesore <laughs> because because I can picture what should be there instead, right? Okay, okay, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of it in my neighborhood, but I just... Yeah, and as a landscaper, oh my gosh. I mean, how can you get that uh, for Scythia to look good, the shape of it? It's almost impossible. And and it just like keeps on, keeps on, you know, getting bigger and more gangly and just, uh, <laughs> you know. I, I take them out whenever I can. Okay. Well, I never like four. Yeah. Yeah. Side yeah. street. Yeah. Actually, any other comments or questions? There's some wonderful lists there. Yes. Um, is there one place to get a lot of those lists? One or? place to get lists. Yeah, there's a lot to write well, down. the ones that you gave, I. I, I know. I know. I know. I know. Well, the, the tell you what, uh, Massachusetts Pollinator Network is one that occurs to me, but then it's hard to, it's hard to stop. I mean, there, there's one that I didn't even mention, Tufts Pollinator Initiative. Tufts Pollinator Initiative. I mean, a lot of these places are trying to be helpful and give you a lot of resources. So uh, it's, it's hard to say which is best, right? Uh, Pollinator Pathways is one that I like a lot. So just do, do some exploration. You've got plenty of time. You know, it, you, don't, you don't have to do this immediately. And especially over the winter, you can like take time to just like explore, right? They're just beautiful. I yeah. was 
I want one of each. I know. <laughs> you want several of each. You want several of each. I got a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. The crit, like I have deer and bunnies in my yard. I've gotten rid of the groundhogs and that took me like six years. <laughs> the bunnies are adorable, yeah. but they eat. Like I can't keep my black eyed Susan. Okay, no, that's right. They love, yeah. So, and I know like, yeah. and my sunflowers. So you start with seed and they get about two inches there and then there's a salad bar. Okay, you're right, right, gone. right, right. So I can't, <laughs> right. like it's like, a, like do, so, having trouble catching. Right. Them because they're a little wiry. Right. So, so the 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 question, the the comment there is about the the, the those hungry vegetarians I mentioned, the deer, the the groundhogs, the rabbits, right. and and uh, but there are some plants that those animals are not interested in, and you can you know consult the resources that I mentioned, the CCE, okay. right, Cornell Cornell Cooperative Extension. Yeah. I mentioned that yeah. um, that's being a good place to start, or just do your own search. You know, deer resistant well, plants or yeah. wild, deer resistant native plants. Yeah. For pollinators, <laughs> right? I figured um, out most of the deer ones. The rabbits I'm having. Yeah, black yeah, Susan's yeah, yeah. My personal favorite. Yeah, so, yeah. And I had a whole yeah. garden. I around. understand. Oh, I understand the frustration. Started, so that's all gone yeah. now. Yeah. I'm trying to start over and now. Yeah. The bunnies. Right. Green, you know what I mean? So <laughs> yes, I the, the rabbits do like do yeah. like those. A lot of those plants that are in the Astra family are attractive to those. Those vegetarians we're talking about, yeah. Okay, they're very cute and they're very healthy. Yes. <laughs> if, if if you want to try to get some plants, yep, to d dissuade the deer and the bunnies or what, try some anise syrup. Okay. It will spread very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they won't eat it. Eat no. It. Yeah. Those those animals will not eat anise hyssop. You're right. Oh, and and anise hyssop and anise hyssop is a fantastic pollinator plant. They're right. they're swarming over anise hyssop. Yeah. Any of the strong smelling. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. So we're talking about the mints now. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. mints are the mints are all the mints are all good at taking care at, at taking care of themselves. Right. Yeah. So uh, I would like to invite you to help yourself to a plant over there. There, I'm giving them away. And uh, I think, well, hopefully there's enough so that one, each of you can go home with one. And uh, thanks again for doing your part. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. Okay. Thank you so much.